Um, nothing to do with Doncaster, but it leads us on to some reflections of the last uh, two years in Doncaster. As with all stories, it starts once upon a time. A long time ago, there was a man who was riding a camel through the desert, and a sandstorm blew up. His camel reared up, threw him off his back, and he landed flat on his back in the middle of the desert. The storm passed, the camel was nowhere to be seen, and this poor man, for seven blistering days and seven freezing nights, wandered through the desert looking for his camel. He was parched, he was not in a good way at all. Suddenly, in the distance, he sees a Coca-Cola vendor with a lovely parasol, one of those nice big ice buckets, full of bottles of Coca-Cola spilling out the top. That looked good. He crawled painfully towards the Coca-Cola vendor, shielding his eyes from the burning sun. And as he drew close, the vendor looked at him and saw him shielding his eyes and said to him, are you sunburned, my friend? <coughs> said the man. What he was thinking was, sunburn? I've never been so sunburned in my life. When I was a ball boy at Wimbledon, all those years ago in my schoolboy shorts, my legs started peeling. I couldn't get off the court because it was a semi-final. Then we went straight into the final. I've never been so sunburned in my life. <coughs> was all he could say, though. Are you hot, my friend? said the vendor. Hot? He'd never been so hot since his wife got cross with him and locked him in the sauna. For four hours he was in there. Burning away, he got so hot, he fainted four times, and by the time she opened the door to let him out, he couldn't even argue anymore, he just collapsed. But <coughs> was all he could say. Are you thirsty, my friend? said the vendor. Thirsty? He'd never been so thirsty since he'd run the Sydney Marathon in the hottest year that the marathon had ever been run. All the water ran out by the 16-mile stage. He had to do the last eight miles with no water whatsoever. Finally, at the last two miles, someone offered him a bottle of water, but he was so thirsty, his tongue had swollen up, he couldn't even drink any. He had never been so thirsty in his life. But all he could say was <coughs> The vendor passed him a bottle of Coca-Cola. Have a drink, my friend. He opened the bottle, took a couple of sips, and his voice came back. Camel! He shouted, I want my bloody camel! I want to get out of this desert! The poor vendor looked at him and said, If only you'd told me that, I'd have known. That's the end of that story, and it brings us into a reflection here of Doncaster. In uh, last month, we saw our 1,000th uh, client in the Living Well service in Doncaster, which has given us some time. Uh, to reflect on what we've learned. This isn't a camel, obviously. Do you know what that is? Push me, pull you. Push me, pull you. What we've been reflecting, uh, I suppose, as we think of, of the, the next phase of the survivorship program is that there's two sort of things going on. And in a way, we've been thinking our job has been to, to sort of identify and supply the camel. But we might be wrong. Pushing people out of Clinical supervision is something we've heard a lot about this morning in a safe and recovering way, if I can use that word. Pulling people into uh, support where it's needed and where it's appropriate is something we've been exploring uh, very much in Doncaster over the last year. We, um, when we started in, in Doncaster uh, asking people affected by cancer, I think Richard mentioned this morning in, in his talk, there are about 100 or so uh, people, carers, patients, uh, people living beyond cancer. Um, the quote in the middle was from quite a senior member of the nursing staff. Um, uh, the words around the, the edge of the screen are the themes that emerged from the stories, the experiences of those hundred or so people affected by cancer. These were the things that were bothering, that were getting in the way of getting the most out of life. And what I suppose we realised at that stage was that the NHS is important, hugely important in cancer treatment, in ongoing monitoring, in addressing uh, and identifying uh, recurrence, side effects, etc. But what was actually stopping people from getting the most out of life didn't really have a lot to do with the NHS, or at least 
the clinical nurse specialist teams were addressing a lot of these issues, but I think, as Kevin mentioned, some of the sort of screening, some of the questions that were being asked weren't actually uh, uh, addressing these issues because the answer wasn't known. So we set about trying to look for answers and without investing huge amounts of money and without setting up new services. The bad news was that it all got very complex very quickly. This is a, 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 a picture of just two people's experiences. Um, Richard, you heard this morning, Alan over to the left. I think Alan's in the room. And some of the solutions that people affected by cancer came up with to address the, the challenges that had come out of those stories. And there were hundreds of these stories, and very quickly we got a very complex idea of, of what people's needs were. The good news was um, that um, with this complexity, uh, there were sort of some emerging key, key themes, which we felt in the working groups that were led by people affected by cancer, we might have something to say about. The pathways, there's the, the NCSI pathway on the left there, don't worry if you can't see it, that's not the point. The point is that, that what, we are, what we realized we were trying to address was the individual in the middle here and all sorts of pulls on their life, from family, from work, from uh, emotional worries, from uh, clinical concerns, recurrence concerns, etc. Um, they've all been named this morning, I won't, I won't go into them. So the good news was um, that we, we um, set out on, on what's called the co-production approach. That may mean different things to different people. Um, but in a nutshell, I suppose, what we've written up there is that expertise is not just within uh, clinical professionals' heads. It's um, very much as well within the personal experience and knowledge of uh, the individual patients, their families. And what we grew to discover was that there was an enormous amount of uh, ready commissioned, freely available service within the community um, that was utterly and totally relevant to the concerns that had been identified by people affected by cancer. So that was great. It then got, goes complex again, doesn't it? I love George's picture of the lady lying down on the couch thinking, well, we know what we've got to do, now I need a bit of a lie down, because we've had that feeling again and again and again as we've tried to extrapolate uh, issues out into sort of more simple themes and bring them back into a structure. And boy, does the NHS love structure and, and diagrams. Um, we've, um, the, the approach we've been using for the last year is to have a, a hub which essentially consists of, of three and more recently four different service providers uh, already commissioned, one in the, the uh, Community Information and Support Centre, um, one in a newly uh, commissioned uh, um, community interest company called Meeting New Horizons, which is commissioned by the local authority to help to develop community resilience, which is a word I'll come back to, and uh, Cancer Buddies, you heard from Ali this morning, um, her volunteers are doing a fantastic job um, not only at helping to provide emotional support, uh, but also getting involved in all and any other voluntary activity that, that seems to come up on this programme. Things like Richard's um, uh, early prevention and uh, diagnosis work with the, with the CCG. Um, it's a one-stop shop, so wherever you come into that service, a conversation happens, and the teams that, that, that are part of it um, identify where in that sort of triangle of services you might best be able to get your holistic needs assessment, which is um, a, a word that, that, again, has different meanings to different people. The point is that if your needs um, are mainly of the um, uh, uh, clinical and emotional type, there is an NHS uh, oversight, uh, which means that CNSs are more willing, perhaps, to release um, patients into the, the Living Well service. But there are some needs that, that don't really get, get answered by the NHS and questions don't get asked in order to find out those needs. The Meeting New Horizons team um, have assembled between all the community providers that we can discover in Doncaster over 100 distinct different services that are um, able to address some of the needs that, that were in those eight themes I showed you earlier. Anything from 
um, people living in isolation at home getting back into some sort of community support or life. Things like um, food bank deliveries, food bank food being brought to your home whilst you're doing childcare, or uh, for many, childcare is a massive issue. Um, I think Kevin showed a slide earlier with some of these psychosocial um, and, and familial issues, which are the things that, that really stop people in their tracks, getting back to work, um, being financially stable. Um, we, we, we've, we, we've, we've heard so many of them. But to have had that resource in Doncaster, which has enabled us to connect with those community providers um, who are already doing fantastic work, nothing to do with cancer, but what we've been able to do is to get them to become what we call survivor friendly. Dot's left for the day, she should shoot me if she heard that, but that's what we're calling them, survivor friendly. They, they have named individuals within their ranks who submit to or, or willingly um, go to uh, uh, training on uh, basic cancer awareness, listening and responding, um, uh, and, and it's, that training is becoming more bespoke as we get feedback from service users as to what they consider gets them moving on and, and getting the most out of life. Over 100 services for free. The private sector is now wanting to join in. We've got boiler companies who want to do free boiler repair. We've got 78 retail uh, businesses in a satellite town of Doncaster called Bawtry who all want to become survivor friendly. How on earth we deal with that, we don't know yet, but we're trying to work out a sort of ethical framework for dealing with the private sector. Um, and, and, and that sort of lying down moment, again, we have to do often when these new things appear. The point is, I suppose, that um, we, we have been able to engage with organisations who traditionally have seen themselves providing a service in a small area over a huge borough, um, but who now have a sort of special cancer unit within them at, at, at very little cost and um, that is uh, valued, we know, by the people who use it because we get the feedback um, in real time uh, as people use those services. And sometimes we've had to sort of debadge services and offer them a bit more support and training so that they can become survivor friendly again after bad feedback. The individuals, those named individuals within those organisations often themselves have had an experience of cancer as carer or patient and um, they have become um, really um, key to, to a growing network of, of volunteers. What we've learnt, I think, is that um, this is a relational process rather than a methodological one. Um, we have definitely struggled with the uh, more the, the clinical recovery package um, type of um, uh, phase of our work is, is time to reflect on why that is. Um, but, but certainly from our work out in the community and engaging those community um, organisations, small and big, um, we, 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 we recognise that the, that the push and the pull have to work together one cannot work without the other. You can't push people out without something to pull them in. There's a balance there. And the question we're always asking ourselves is who's the expert here? Because often it's the person affected by cancer themselves who has so much more expertise than the person they're face to face with. The camel at the end, we've discovered, is not the destination, it's the journey. The camel is just a piece of transport that we can use to help people to find their own destination. And I think for us, that's the big uh, reflection as we enter the third phase um, of this programme, which we're all very excited about. And could I just ask my Doncaster colleagues just to wave or stand up, um, because all the work they've done has been really quite astounding. Um, and, and, and there's our marathon runner over there. Thank you very much. <laughs>